Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at our Keynesian cross. So this was introduced in our last video. In this one, what we're going to be doing is just going through a walkthrough, working through how to solve it, some more examples of ways to play around with it, ways to solve it, and some of the kind of questions that I could ask about the Keynesian cross and how we could work through solving them. So let's go, let's jump over, let's take a look at that, and let's start working through a scenario. So let's suppose we have a model economy, and let's suppose that this model economy was described, uh, amongst other things, we'll say a marginal propensity to consume of 95%, so 0.95. Keep in mind again what that means. It means that for every dollar earned in disposable income, we're going to spend 95 cents on consumption goods and then 5 cents into savings. Then, let's suppose that we have a tax rate of 20%. So that is the government is taking 20 cents off of every dollar towards their tax revenue. We're then going to be taking a look at, uh, let's say we have autonomous consumption. Let's say that guy is sitting at 700. We'll say we have autonomous investment. We'll say sitting at 500. Government expenditure, let's say that this guy is 600, and exports, we'll say that guy there is sitting at, oh, let's say, let's say another 600. Okay, finally, last thing we need to know is the marginal propensity to import, and we'll say we have a small marginal propensity to import, that is, right, we're not buying much from abroad, we do most of our purchases most we don't have much international trade going on as well oh not necessarily international trade but we don't have very much purchases from abroad occurring and we'll say that our marginal prints import is only at one percent 0.01 that is for every dollar spent domestically every dollar of income that we earn we only spend one percent of that on imported goods now keep in mind sometimes you might see funny other things showing up in here sometimes you'll see something like hey Wages are equal to 350 or depreciation is equal to 0.21y or something like that, right? And often there will be these extra little terms thrown in, but what you really have to remember going through our Keynesian cross, our planned aggregate expenditure is they don't matter. We've never used them before. Just because all of a sudden you see them pop up on a question does not mean they're relevant. Sometimes it's just extra bit of information, information from maybe the income side of measuring GDP rather than the expenditure, and thus you can just ignore it. So anything like that pops up and we can just say, yep, yeah, thank you, but no thank you. That is irrelevant information. Okay. So what we want to do to start off, let's say our first question is we need to solve for equilibrium level of national income. So we have all this information. We need to work it out in order to find out, hey, what is our equilibrium level of national income? So to start off, we need to go and we'll start off by writing our planned aggregate expenditure is just our expenditure model of finding GDP. So consumption investment, government expenditure and net exports. So that's going to be exports minus imports. From here, we need to open things up. Some of these guys are induced and they actually have a function representing what they are. So for example, consumption will open up to our consumption function. Yielding for us our planned aggregate expenditure is our consumption function, marginal propensity to consume. 1 minus our tax rate times our income plus our autonomous consumption. Okay, so that's our consumption function. We then carry down investment, so plus investment. We carry down government expenditure. We carry down exports. Right, and again, for these guys, we're just carrying these guys down because they're autonomous. That is, they are independent of income, independent of GDP. It's why there's no multiplier of Y attached to it, right? Keep in mind this little C from our consumption function, that guy was autonomous as well. 
So all the under, red underlined, these were our autonomous components. We then have minus imports. Imports was again our induced component. That was our marginal propensity to import times income, times Y. At this point, we could choose just to throw in all the information we have. We have it all here. It's just a matter of plugging and playing. So let's go ahead and do that. So working it out, marginal propensity to consume, well, we have our planned aggregate expenditure is 0 0.95, one minus our tax rate. So that's one minus 0.2, that's gonna give me 0.8 times Y plus, okay, keep in mind, all of these autonomous components, these are just a number. Typically, if we were working through this algebraically, we would just call all of these together A. A for autonomous, and in this case here, these guys here work out to, just adding it up, six and six, well, that's gonna be 1,200, uh, 12 and five, that will be 1,700, and then 1,700 and seven, well, that's gonna be 2,400. So there we go we have our total autonomous expenditure. So let's add that in there. Finally, we have this imports kicking around. So we would go minus MY, well, M is 0 0.01 Y. So working through this, what do we have? We have a few like terms here. We have all of this Y, we have this Y. So let's simplify the left-hand side and then collapse them down together. So planned aggregate expenditure equals 0.95 times 0.8. That gives me 0.76y plus my autonomous of 2400 minus my imports of 0.01y. Okay, let's collapse these like terms together. 0.76y minus 0.01y, we have our planned aggregate expenditure equal to 0.7y plus 2400. So there we go, we have our situation, we have our scenario there. Let's carry on from here. What do we do next? Well, we're looking for equilibrium level of national income. Let's keep in mind, let's draw this because our equilibrium pops out at us through our diagram. We have our vertical axes, we have our horizontal axes. Always remember to fully label the axes. And we have planned aggregate expenditure on the vertical. We have income or GDP on the horizontal. And then we have this 45 degree line such that along this line, everywhere along that point, Y equals planned aggregate expenditure. Our planned aggregate expenditure curve itself, we'll do that guy in blue. It's starting off at our autonomous level. So we'll say 2400 is something as such. We'll go 2400, that's our autonomous expenditure. We then are gonna have a positive slope, 0 0.75 is the slope there. That is our marginal propensity to spend of 0 0.75. And I get my planned aggregate expenditure. I'll go PAE naught. That is, that's my initial one, right? At that point, I'm going to have an equilibrium. Equilibrium occurs where the two lines cross, and that will give us some equilibrium level of national income. So, okay. How do we find the value of that? How do we determine what is this equilibrium level of national income? Well, we can do so. Keep in mind, hey, that occurred right there, right where GDP equaled planned aggregate expenditure. So our equilibrium condition is Y equals PAE. So that's Y equals, well, what does PAE equal? PAE equals all of this. So that is GDP equals 0.75Y plus 2,400. We have Y common to both sides, so let's combine those. Y minus 0.75Y equals 2,400. 
y is common to both, so we can factor that out. We get y 1 minus 0 0.75 equals 2400. Finally, getting that y by itself, so it's now our equilibrium level of national income, so we'll call it y prime, and that will be 1 over 1 minus 0 0.75 all times 2400. And remember, the reason why I want this guy separated out separately is because this term here on its own, that works out to be my multiplier, telling me how many times a single dollar multiplies around my circular flow diagram before it approaches zero. <clears throat> so working this out, we get y prime equals 1 over 1 minus 0.75. So I get a multiplier of 4 times my autonomous expenditure of 2400. So keeping in mind again, this four telling me that every dollar inputted into my economy would cycle through that circular flow diagram four times before it is essentially zero and no longer has any impact on our economy, on our level of output, income, expenditure. So working that out, four times 2400, we have a new y prime of 9600. I shouldn't say a new y prime. This is, this is the first one we found out. So y prime not the initial guy there of 9600. Okay. So there we go. We have our initial level of GDP. We know where this economy is sitting in that sense there. From here, we can do one of two things. We can apply some shocks to this. That is, we can say that certain events have happened and then how do those events influence our level of national income. We can also go and look at a bunch of different metrics as well as to figuring out, well, what are some things happening in this economy? So for example, what we could end up asking is we could say, hey, what is our current level of consumption? We could say, what is our current level of savings? We could ask similarly, what is our level of national savings? And then with that as well, I could ask, what is the current sitting of my trade balance? That is, what are my net exports sitting at? Uh, we could ask what our public savings are. And we could say, what are our capital flows? Are we having capital inflows or capital outflows? So we'll go capital flows, right? And we can work through all of these things just, just from the information we have actually. So let's, let's start off by this and let's calculate all these guys and then uh, see, see how this works all together. So starting off right at the top there, let's work out our value of consumption. And well, what do we do? How do we get that? Well, keep in mind, in order to get that, what we need to do is we just need to go back up here and we need to pull out our consumption function. This guy right here. That guy's our consumption function. So let's write that down. We're going to have a consumption function of marginal propensity to consume. That's 0 0.95 times our disposable income. So that's one minus my tax rate of 20% times my income plus my autonomous consumption, little c there, of 700. Okay, so we have everything, but why? What are we going to use for GDP? Well, the natural one to use is, hey, we've just solved for the equilibrium. We've solved for, hey, what our value of GDP is right now. So it makes sense. Let's use that as our value of GDP to figure out our value of consumption. That is, we want to know, hey, we have our equilibrium level of national income. What's our value of consumption at that equilibrium level of national income? So let's go work that through. Well, let's just make some room for us to do that. Let's push all of those guys down. And we're going to have savings so... 0.95 times 
that gives me 0 0.76 times GDP. Well, GDP we worked out to be 9,600 plus 700. So 0 0.76 times 9,600 plus 700. And that gives us our consumption as a function of income as 7,996. Okay, so we have that one there. Great, first one done, first one taken care of. Next one, let's take a look at savings. What are we gonna have for our savings? Now, keep in mind, savings is just the leftover, the difference between the amount of money we have as a household and the amount we've spent on consumption. The difference there is gonna be our savings. What I often see, and this is, this is a mistake, what I often see is we've calculated consumption, we've already calculated income. I see a lot, we'll say, okay, 9,600, that's my income, minus 7,996, that's my consumption, and then they say, there we go, that's my savings. But no, 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 that, that's, that's not going to be correct. That's, that's going to be very, okay, why is that going to be wrong? Well, the reason why that's going to be wrong is you don't want to use this 9,600, right? It's not about our total GDP, our total output, our total income. It's about our income after tax. It's our disposable income. So what we need to do is we need to have our disposable income minus our consumption function. If we work through that, we'll get our result. So let's, let's go work through that. What's our disposable income here? Well, disposable income, keep in mind, disposable income is going to be our income, 9,600, times the leftover after taxes. So one minus my tax rate of 20%. That is going to be all together my disposable income minus my consumption. And that's going to yield for me my savings function. Okay, so 9,600 times 1 minus 0 0.2, that's 9,600 times 0 0.8. That yields for us a disposable income of 7,680 minus our consumption of 7,996. So hey, we have our disposable income minus our consumption. 7680 minus 7996, we get negative 316 as our savings. That is, as we see in there, that is negative savings. We are dissaving, thus, we are borrowing money. So, what about our national savings? How would we get that? Well, in order to get our national savings, we need to remember what exactly we mean by our national savings. So that is our national savings all together was, oh, let's, let's change colors for this guy. Let's go, let's go to yellow. Our national savings were our private savings plus our public savings. So that was Y minus C minus T plus T minus G, right? And that is, hey, we could rearrange this left side here and let's just use a bit of a better eraser. There we go. We just swap these two around. There's Y minus T minus C. And hey, by doing that, we had income minus taxes. Hey, that was disposable income. Disposable income, disposable income minus consumption, minus consumption. That gave us our private savings, right? So this guy here, this was our private savings, which, hey, hey, we've just worked that out. We've just worked that out to be negative 316. That is, we have negative savings. We have dis-savings. We are borrowing from our future. Okay, so that's, that's our private savings. Well, we have to figure out this other half of it which is our public savings. Public savings. So, okay, we can do that. That's just going to be T minus G. 
So, okay, t minus g. Let's just plug and play and go along with that. So let's go back up to our big list of everything explaining this economy. We have t of 0 0.2 and we have g of 600. So this, this is what I end up seeing a lot here. I end up seeing a lot of 0 0.2 minus 600 here. And this is, this is grossly wrong. This is terribly wrong, right? And the big thing to keep in mind is this is capital T here. While up here, we have lowercase t. These are, these are very different variables. And why are they different variables? What are they getting at? Well, this here, this lowercase t of 0 0.20, this is my tax rate. This is how much money the government's collecting per dollar of income. T, big T in this case there, that's our tax revenue. That's the total amount of money that the government's collecting. And keep in mind, this total tax revenue, this can be determined as the tax rate, the tax per dollar of income, times, right, times our GDP. So that is, although we don't know the tax revenue altogether, we can actually figure out that tax revenue altogether pretty easily by putting that in. So that is tax revenue T is going to be 0 0.2 times our total GDP, 9,600, minus our government expenditure. So minus, what did we have for government expenditure? I believe it was 600. Yeah, we had 600 right there. So going back down, that is minus 600. So working out that, what is that? 0.2 times 9,600. We have total tax revenue of 1920 minus 600 gives me 1920 minus 600 of 1320. Okay, right. We've done a lot of jumping around. We've done a lot of looking things. Often I see people are like, I'm, I found a number. Cool. This must be my answer. What am I calculating? What does it mean? Maybe I'm done. Maybe I just put a box around 1320 and say, there we go. I found out what I'm looking for. No, 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 right? Always keeping track. What are we looking for? Right now, we were looking for just our public savings, right? Just our value of public savings there. The value of, hey, was our government on whole? Were they running a budget surplus? That is, they had money left over? Or were they running a, a budget deficit? That is, they had to borrow money to finance all their expenditure. In this case, we have 1320. That's a positive meaning that, hey, our government was running a surplus. They had savings. But what are we looking to find? We're looking to find our national savings, which is private plus public. Our private was minus 316. Our public is plus 320. So we get negative 316 plus 1320. We get all together our national savings to be 1320 minus 316, we get 1,004 to be our value of national savings. So we get our final answer there. Meaning, hey, on whole, on whole, this economy, this region that we're looking at, they are savers. They are saving more than they're spending. Okay, let's carry on down our list. Let's just move our list of things we're finding over here now. And hey, with that, one of the things we were looking for is public savings. Well, we could go and calculate this again, or we can just kind of do a little bit of a cheat here. We can say, hey, we've already got this guy. We've already got this one. Let's just throw this guy back over here. And we can say, hey, we've calculated our public savings to be 1320. Right? Because that was this big T minus G. We already had that. We're good. We're good. Okay. What about net exports? Well, net exports, this is going to be exports minus our imports. We know that imports is actually M times Y. So, making a little bit of room, let's get rid of capital flows here. Move that down. Exports, well, we can look that up. That guy there, that's just an autonomous variable. Exports is 600. Imports, or marginal propensity to import, is 
So, okay, let's throw in that information we know. That's 600 minus my marginal propensity import, 1%, times my GDP of 9,600. So, okay, 1% of 9,600. Well, that's not too bad to work out. That's 96. So we have 600 minus 96. I'm going to have a value of net exports of 600 minus 96 being $504. That's not too bad. So what are my capital flows? Right? Are we having capital inflows? Are we having capital outflows? What's going on here? Well, let's keep in mind what's going on. We have a situation where, hey, we are selling more stuff to the world. That is, we're buying, or sorry, not we're not buying, they're buying all of our stuff. So, hey, we have this surplus of money. We have this surplus of money going on in this case here. So what are we going to do with it all? Well, with all of this, we need to take this money and we need to put it somewhere. And that is essentially all these IOUs that foreign countries owe us. So we're going to have all together capital outflows of 504, right? And, and that has to be it. Our capital account and our current account always have to balance, always have to equal out. And again, if you're like, ah, oh, how do I know if that's an outflow or an inflow? I'm so confused by this, which direction it is. The way that I find that this works best is to think about this current account, your net exports, is your own personal budget. Your exports are your wage, everything of yours that you sell to make money. Your imports are everything you buy. So if you have this positive net exports, hey, you finished the month, you finished the year with surplus money, right? You've spent less money than you've brought in. So what do you do with all that surplus money? Well, you put it in the bank. That is You've essentially bought a financial asset, a financial instrument. That purchase of a financial instrument is a capital outflow. You're like, oh, no, that's my savings account. No, no, no. You've given that money to the bank. You have said, here you go, bank. I had an extra $500. I'm giving it to you. I'm putting it on loan to you. I'm lending you money, bank. That's what your savings account is. That is a capital outflow. If, if this worked out differently, and maybe we had some value of net exports is negative 500, right? Mathematically doesn't work, but let's just presume negative 500 is somehow what we ended up with. This would be like a situation where you finish off your month and you've spent $500 more than you've brought in an income. How is that possible? How do you spend more money than you have an in income? Well, it's because you borrowed that money. How do you borrow that money? Because you've taken capital from the bank. Instead of outflowing capital to the bank, you have brought capital in from the bank. You would have taken out a $500 loan. So in that case there, if we had negative net exports, we would have had capital inflows. So just that aside for us. Okay, so that answers that off. That wraps it up for that. We could do one more thing just to double check that all of this actually makes sense as we work through it. And that is, as we go through, sorry, let's go down here, take a look at this. We can go back to this whole equation of capital inflows, net exports and all that, national savings. And keep in mind what we said is ultimately we worked out, ah, let's change colors, let's use a new color. We worked out that national savings minus investment was equal to our net exports, right? We worked that through in our capital flows chapter and all that. That is on the left-hand side, we have our capital flows, our capital account. On the right-hand side, we have our current account, our net exports. So, hey, we have that worked out as 504. As a check to make sure that, hey, we didn't mess anything up in any of our other calculations, we could throw in our other values. We could say, okay, we have national savings here of 1,004, and we have investment here of 500. So if I go 1,004 minus 500, what am I left with? I'm left with 504 equals 
504. And that's a good sign, right? That is just another way that we can go through this and make sure that everything's double checking, lining up, everything's good in that sense there. So here we've had an example. We've calculated our value of GDP. We've then worked through based off of that value of GDP, what is my consumption? What is my savings? What is my private savings? My public savings? My national savings? We've worked out our current account balance. We've worked out our net exports or our cap or sorry, our current account balance, our capital account balance as well on the left side there. What else have we worked out? I think that's what we worked out our uh, public savings, right? Our budget deficit versus budget surplus. So all of this we can work out just once we have this initial value of GDP. From here, we can also explore this a different direction. And in order to explore this a different direction, let's just quickly make some notes. They'll pop up on the left-hand side there. And then let's carry on with this and change some stuff up. So let's go do that. So let's suppose in this scenario here that the government ends up changing their tax rate. So from the 20% that we started off at, let's suppose they engage in some fiscal policy that is using their resources as government to either change their expenditure or the rate of taxation, and they decide to drop the tax rate to 0.147. So that is, right, they're dropping it by just over 5 percentage points. Now, for every dollar of income earned, they're only going to collect 14.7 cents per dollar. Now, okay, two ways to think of this happening, right? Really, when we're talking about this little lowercase t, we're talking about the net tax rate. So this is either A, government's providing tax breaks. They're saying, here you go, here's a tax break. You don't need to spend as much. You don't have to give us as much in business tax, income tax, property tax, sales tax, all of the taxes that are out there, right? This is all together aggregated tax rate. The other way to think about this because this is net taxes is perhaps the government has kept taxing everybody the same, but they're offering more subsidies, right? So maybe they're offering better employment insurance, um, better pension payout. Maybe this is included in that, hey, our COVID relief fund. Right, our SERB payments. All of a sudden, because we're giving out all these subsidies and SERB payments, it's as if the net tax rate fell. So either a decrease in our taxes or an increase in our subsidies, either case of that would result in a falling net tax rate. So that'd be the idea working through here. Okay, as we work through this, what we want to do is we want to figure out what is our new international, international, wow, what is our new equilibrium level of national income? And we want to find that new result. So, okay, in order to do that, we just need to solve for our new plan aggregate expenditure function. Now, going through that, you might notice as we go through all of our autonomous components, None of these guys have changed. The only thing that's changed has been the tax rate. So, hey, this is still, that is still 2,400. If that's still 2,400, well, our new planned aggregate expenditure is right at that same point. Does that mean it's just the same, the same line? Well, not necessarily. We've had a change. Change in tax rate, where does that fit in? Well, where does that fit in? That there is part of our marginal marginal propensity to spend, right? Our marginal propensity to spend, that is our marginal propensity to consume, one minus our tax rate minus our marginal propensity to import. So here we've had a decrease in the tax rate and we need to work out what the impact is gonna be all together on our marginal propensity to spend. That is essentially our new plan aggregate expenditure shares the same autonomous expenditure, but will have a different slope. So let's work that through. So just plugging in our new values, right? Just working out this marginal propensity to spend. Our marginal propensity to spend is same marginal propensity to consume, 0 0.95. Change in tax rate, well, we now have one minus 0 0.147. Minus my marginal propensity import, that's 1%, 0 0.01. Okay, if we work all this out, 0 0.95 times 1 minus 0 0.0147, get that one, minus 0 0.01. That's 
that works out to be a marginal propensity to spend of 0 0.8, 0, 0, yeah, essentially 0 0.8. So, okay, 0 0.8 is our new marginal propensity to spend. Our autonomous expenditure, that's that stayed the same. So we have our new planned aggregate expenditure. I'll call this planned aggregate expenditure one, or alternatively, we can call it our planned aggregate expenditure given our new tax rate. And that's gonna be marginal propensity to spend 0 0.8 times Y plus 2,400. So, okay, to visualize that, and let's use we have blue for our initial one. Let's use green for our updated one. We're starting off at the same intercept of 2,400, but we now have this new slope of 0.8. Well, the original slope was 0.75, so we need to figure, okay, is this steeper, is this shallower, where does this fit? Well, 0.8, bigger number, this is, this is steeper. So, gives us, maybe I'm exaggerating that a bit, but gives us a new slope along those lines. That would be our planned aggregate expenditure given our T1. So that's what we would have there, new updated planned aggregate expenditure. And with a new updated planned aggregate expenditure comes with it a new GDP, right? So we have a new equilibrium level of national income. And here's the big thing, right? This is where the graph helps us, is we can take a look at this and we can say, oh, look, a cut in taxes hey, cut in taxes, I should expect an increase in output. I should expect my output to be bigger than 9,600. I don't know the value yet. I need to solve for that, but I should expect an increase in output. If I go through my math and I get some value smaller than 9,600, well, that's a red flag. I should be concerned. I've probably made a mistake. So let's go through solving this again. How do we do it? Well, again, our equilibrium situation is when y equals planned aggregate expenditure. So let's set y equal to our planned aggregate expenditure given our new tax rate. So that's y equals, well, planned aggregate expenditure given our new tax rate is this guy. So 0 0.8y plus 2400, okay. Work through our algebraic voodoo to get those y's together, and I get 0 0.2y equals 2400. Get that y by itself, that's y prime equals 1 over 0.2 times 2400. 1 over 0.2, well, what does that yield for us? That is y prime of equals 5 times 2400, right? This five being our multiplier, how many times a single dollar multiplies around our economy before it gets essentially to zero. And we get a new value Y prime given our new tax rate. We get five times 2400. What does that yield for us? That yields 12,000. So there we go. 12,000 is our new equilibrium level of GDP. What I would encourage you to do to work through, just to kind of check your skills with this, is given this new level of equilibrium national income, find out what is our new consumption. How has consumption changed given a change in taxes? How has savings changed given a change in taxes? How has our public savings changed? How has our net exports changed? Our national savings changed? And of course, well, we have our new equilibrium. Sorry, not Y not zero. Y prime given T1 of 12,000. Okay, so we've worked through a scenario here where the government dropped their tax rate. They dropped taxes as taxes dropped, GDP increased because essentially the rationale behind, if we go back to our circular flow diagram, is we had more money available to us for consumption. Having more money available to us for consumption means that our multiplier jumped from its initial value of four up to a value of five, 
So in that case there, just by having more money available to us to circulate around the economy, that additional time results in an increase of GDP by, well, increase of GDP by $2,400, right? We've just had a good boost, good boost right there. So that's one way that the government can look using fiscal policy to stimulate or push the economy to a higher level. What they can also do though, is instead of cutting taxes, they have another option available to them, and that is that is to increase their expenditure. So let's work through a different example. Let's go right back to our initial starting point. But in this case here, let's change our level of expenditure. So we'll go back to our taxes being at 20%, but instead of changing taxes to stimulate the economy, let's suppose we want to change our government expenditure to stimulate the economy. And let's take a look at that. Okay, let's suppose that the government similarly wants to hit a boost to GDP. They want to help people out. They want to increase our output. And in this case, the way they want to do this is not by cutting taxes. So we're not cutting taxes any longer. That is, we're leaving taxes at that 20%. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to increase our government expenditure from 600 to 1200 so in this scenario, all we have really is an update to our autonomous expenditure. So if we work that through, uh, what colors do we have already? We have green, we have blue. Let's do a red planned aggregate expenditure curve. We're going to have our planned aggregate expenditure given government one, which is going to be equal to, well, our marginal propensity to spend. Well, hey, that's going to be just what it was before our tax change. That is 0.75. Oh, that's a bad five. 0 0.75, why? Plus our autonomous expenditure. Well, our autonomous expenditure used to be 2,400. Government expenditure increased to 1,200. That is, we had plus 600 G, a doubling of our government expenditure. Well, plus 600 G, that's the only part of autonomous that's changed, means that that was also plus 600A, meaning our new autonomous expenditure is now gonna be 3,000. So there we go. We have our new planned aggregate expenditure curve. Now we just need to draw it and then solve for equilibria. So let's go about drawing it there. And in this case, oh, actually, you know what? Let's change things up. Let's solve it first and then we'll draw it. Just, just to spice things up, right? So, okay, let's go y equals our planned aggregate expenditure given our G1. Okay, so we have that. Y equals, well, planned aggregate expenditure given G1, that's this guy. So that's 0 0.75 y plus 3,000, 3, sorry. Isolate our y's, so subtract 0.75 y from both sides. We get 0.25y equals 3,000, or we get y equals 1 over 0.25 times 3,000. That's y prime is 4 times 3,000. So, okay, 4 times 3,000, what does that give us? Well, 4 times 3,000, surprise, y prime given our g1 gives us 12,000. That is, we're gonna be right at this exact same level of output. That is, we've obtained the same outcome through two different methods. That first method was cutting taxes. This next method was increasing government expenditure, both giving us though the same final outcome of $12,000 worth of output, $12,000 worth of GDP. Okay. Let's draw this. So same same slope, different intercept. So given the computer here, I'm going to kind of cheat. I'm going to just draw this line right on top of the original one there. And then I'm just going to move it. Oh, maybe that's going to be trickier than I thought. Oh, no, look at that. Nice and easy. Throw it through that intercept point. And I have my planned aggregate expenditure given. G1, this intercept point right there, 
That must be my 3000. With that red and that blue line both having the exact same slope of 7.75. So there we go, drawing that guy in. And we see our diagrams getting a little bit cluttered. A little bit cluttered there. Okay. So again, another shock. This time a shock to autonomous. The last one, a shock to our induced. Right? We can work through shocks on either case. We just implement the shock, implement the new value, and solve for our new equilibrium. Simple as that. What I want to do in going through this is I want to compare the impacts of each policy, though. So that is, let's backtrack and let's solve for our consumption savings, public savings, net exports, national savings, and right again, we had Y prime given G1 that was again of 12,000. Okay, so what we really want to take a look at here, I've thrown in, I've calculated these updated values. Like I was saying, I strongly encourage you to go through this as well and be able to calculate those on your own. You can double check your work next to this one, make sure everything lines up. What we see is that, okay, our blue case, our blue case was the change in our tax, ending up at a GDP of 12,000 versus the red case being a change in our government expenditure. Now, this is not to make a normative statement. This is not to draw any conclusions that, hey, a change in taxation is better than a change in government tax or in a change in government expenditure or vice versa for implementing government policy. Um, because this is, it really depends on where you are in relation to everything. You'll get very different results. All this is really to show is that, hey, we can have the exact same outcome ending up at 12,000, ending up at 12,000, but included in this are actually very different levels of consumption, savings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as we go through it. So let's explore that. Let's take a look at that and what it all means. So first of all, change in taxation, we see that consumption jumps massively. Consumption jumps to over $10,000 versus change in government expenditure. Uh, expend or consumption jumped, but not nearly as drastically. Change in savings, well, we see we had a change in savings, right? Relative to our initial case, we are borrowing less, right? We have more income, more consumption, and also less borrowing. So that is technically we have more savings. Same in the government expenditure case here. Again, versus the 316, we're borrowing less, therefore we're saving more on a private level. What about for our public savings? Well, we see in both scenarios, the government still running a budget surplus. They cut their taxes, they increased their expenditure, they doubled their expenditure. But in both cases, we see their surplus fell, but still running a surplus. We see that the cut in taxation caused the government surplus to fall to 1164, while the increase in government expenditure actually caused the surplus to relatively rise, but still fall with relation to the initial case down to 1200. We see the net exports are not affected, and that shouldn't be a surprise. Exports themselves, well, those are fixed. Those are autonomous at 600, and there is no impact to the marginal propensity to import. So no change to the marginal propensity to import. We have GDP of 12,000 in both cases. So yeah, we're going to have constant net exports of 480. That is, though, in relation, we see that, hey, by changing our government budget balance sheet by changing our level of public savings, that changing in public savings changes our net exports. And hey, by changing our savings in relation to our investment, we're also changing our capital flows. So right, we see a drop in net exports in both scenarios. And as well, we would see a drop in our capital outflows as well from 504 down to 480. National savings, right? We just talked about that. We saw that public savings dropped in both scenarios. Private savings rose slightly, but altogether, national savings fell from 1004 to 975.80 to 980. See a bit of a distinction there. Now, those of you who are really keen working through this, you might go through this and you might be trying to say, go through that whole bit where you're like, okay. National savings minus investment equals net exports. Okay, net exports is 
480 in both cases. Investment, that's 500 in both cases. Why do we have 980 versus 975.80? One of these doesn't actually equal, right? That is this blue case, this change in taxes does not actually equal. It looks like we have a big problem there. Oops, we've done a math error somewhere. Well, okay, okay, to be honest, we kind of had to wave our hands a little bit to get our nice numbers. That is, when we were working through our marginal propensity to spend and we worked it out to be 0 0.80, ah, that was a bit of a lie, right? It was essentially 0 0.80, but what it actually was, it was actually a marginal propensity to spend of 0 0.80035. That is, right, there is these two decimal places kicking around way back here that we just rounded off. Well, because we rounded off these decimal places, we lost some accuracy, and in losing that accuracy, well, we ended up getting a bit of some rounding errors going through. Meaning that truthfully, this value of consumption savings and thus national savings are going to be a little bit off. A little bit off as a result of that. And we see, right, about $4.20 off. About $4.20 off in our national savings side. So likely working out the same between these two. So something to keep in mind is that when we do end up rounding our marginal propensity to spend, it does have follow through effects. Now, mind you, on our detail quizzes, on those kind of scenarios, I typically don't ask you these layered kind of questions. I give you all the information you need and all based off that information, I'm just saying, hey, what's our national savings? I give you all the information you need and I say, hey, what's your public savings, right? And so from that, you're good, you're fine. You won't have this issue with rounding error. But when we are doing these full kind of layered ones, this issue does arise from time to time. So if you ever get this just a little bit off like this, often the result is that little bit of rounding error. Go back and check what your marginal propensity to spend is. Okay. That there was an overview of our Keynesian cross, working through, solving it a bunch of times, changing some stuff around, working through the impacts that has on our Keynesian cross model. Up on D2L, I have also posted a Keynesian cross walkthrough guide. That is a document explaining how to walk through and solve this. It has some examples in there as well, as well as some additional questions at the end to encourage you to work through. If you have any questions on anything we covered in this video, please feel free, comment below, post on the D2L Frequently Asked Questions page, and of course, please feel free to send me an email with any questions. Thanks. I hope you found that helpful. Until next time.